All right, hedging our bets in Nagahama, we got the 20 minute Shinkansen from Kyoto to Maibara and then a nine minute local from Maibara to Nagahama. We're here. I still could not find out online where to actually go once we got to the train station, but lo and behold, there's a sign with a picture of a boat going to an island. I guess that's the place. We were right. Check this out. Here's where we are. We go out this exit. We go through this lovely park to Chikubushima Island. Yay! So now, fingers crossed that there's space because it's first come, first serve. We didn't know we had first serve. No, we didn't. We didn't check online though, so. Their website was garbage. It's true. It's our fault. That's not our fault that their website is garbage. We're on the boat. We made it. We got there. Uh, turns out there's plenty of seats. It was not going to be a problem at all. But we had no idea. We didn't know how big this boat was. It actually reminds us a lot of the Victoria Clipper between Victoria and Seattle, just a lot smaller. So we got to the office, got our tickets, and then spent the next uh, half an hour sitting and watching the World Women's World Cup finals between Japan and the USA. And uh, a bunch of people were like, oh, you're cheering for the U.S. And we're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're Canadian. We're cheering for Japan. <laughs> and uh, sadly, for the, the rest of our friends in the, in the waiting area, Japan got crushed 5-2. But it was fun. We had some good talks, made some new friends. We're significantly lowering the average age of this boat. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. の深さは41.2メートル。最も深いところは、アドガワ河口沖で104メートルとなっています。また大きさは甲子園球場およそ14000個。一部工事中のところございますご注意ください。次の長浜行き12時5分12時5分は長浜行き本線このね弁天。次の今津駅11時20分、11時20分、その後今津駅12時30分、12時30分発今津駅インターラー券ご乗船ください。海の船乗るときには長浜でお買い求めの乗船券確認いたします。半券をいただきますので各自1枚ずつまとめて持たず
But, I mean, but look it's at this. beautiful. Look at this view behind us. It's it's amazing. Go see this. And we're on an island in the middle of nowhere. One of Japan's biggest islands. Lakes. Yeah, it's not one of Japan's biggest islands. No, one of Japan's biggest an island in the middle of one of Japan's biggest lakes is what I meant to say. It's Lake Biwa. It's Lake Biwa. Hey, Devere, but you can't grind this stair set. I don't think I'm going to. No. Prudent. One of the things you can do here is buy little clay discs and write on them your name and a wish, which Kathleen and I did. Both of us, family health, financial success seemed appropriate. And then you chuck them off the balcony and try to get them through a Tory gate. It's a lot further than it looks. All right. <laughs> I believe in you. Man, that's tough. <laughs> it's so much further than you think it is. And they don't fly well. They sort of go... <laughs> then they go back. No, she didn't do it. And you can tell that most people are not successful. What I should have done is curl it in my finger and, like, try to really whip it. But it's 300 yen per pair. So we each did a pair and that was it. Also, the boat is coming back, so we had to haul it back down to the dock. They only give you 80 minutes on the island between ferry trips if you want to take it the most efficient way. And that was just enough time to do everything. It was great. It's like they've worked on this before. They've got this timed out. They're like exactly 80 minutes and you can see everything at a leisurely pace. Worked out well. Also, there's a couple different routes to take, but our route got all the vertical climbing out of the way at the beginning, which I think was the better, better choice. Mm. Agree. They do, uh, drinks are more expensive here. A bottle of water was 250, just like home, <laughs> as opposed to the hundred yen we've been paying all all trip so far. This is very pretty here. I'm glad we came. <laughs> Okay, back on the mainland, got a bit of rain, and now it's three trains to get from here to Gifu, where we are staying the night. And because we're so far ahead of schedule, we should be able to spend the afternoon at Gifu Castle. Wouldn't that be nice? I remember last night when I was like, gee, if we have time, we'll have to be out of there at like two at the latest. Turns out... Turns out it's fast to get around in this country. Well, there's a tiny 7-Eleven. You want to get some onigiri for the train? Yes. Yes. All right, so this is how they package the onigiri at 7-Eleven and other places. It's brilliant. One tab all the way around, and then you pull the two side tabs out, and they've got plastic on the inside to keep the seaweed separate from the rice so the seaweed stays crunchy. I love that. And just like that, we are in Gifu. Now, why are we in Gifu? Well, functionally, because it's about halfway between Kyoto and Takayama, and we didn't want to just, like, haul it the whole the whole way there, which we could have on the trains. They're very good trains. But why here, of all the places we can stop? Well, it was one of the biggest cities. It had a hotel that was available. Really nice hotel. And it's the historical home of Oda Nobunaga, who, if you aren't familiar with Japanese history, you've probably seen him as the bad guy or sometimes the good guy in any historical Japanese video game you've ever played. Like, hell, he was in Onimusha. Uh, and their sort of big tourist thing is this tradition that they've been doing here for 1,300 years since 702, cormorant fishing. 
So we're gonna check that out. The Nagara River, seen here hauling ass, is where we're watching cormorant fishing tonight. There is no dinner aboard the cormorant obs observation vessel, but they suggest that you bring food so that you won't be hungry. So we're like, okay, well, we'll go and get some food, which we got at a really nice ramen express, whatever. And then we, we went around the train station, which is also the bus station, which is how we were getting here, to try and find food for dinner. And there was a place that had to-go bento boxes, uh, but also you could sort of build your own bento by, by weight. A lot of places do this with, uh, with different food, like salad bars back in Canada. So I was like, you know what? I'm going for it. So I grab a little empty bento and I go around. Uh, but the rice has different prices on it. So I, I start to go for the rice and this old woman starts laboriously explaining to me how I'm doing it wrong and how you're supposed to do it. At least I infer that's what she was saying because I did not pick up any of it. And then one of the staff came over and was like, sorry, here's what you have to do. And I just sort of went, I'll just get one of the pre-made ones, please. Okay, goodbye. And so I've got an unagi and tamago thing. It's eel and egg. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then we had bus adventure. So here's the deal with taking a bus. Every city and country's bus system is slightly different. Some buses you pay when you get on, like in North America. Some buses you pay when you get off, like in Japan. I've never taken a bus in Japan before because I've never really had a need to. I've always just taken a JR train or, if not available, another line of train or the subway or something where there's no human interaction. So I get on and we're like, I'm like, how do I pay? Everybody has using a pass, so I'm like, maybe I just have to go up to the front and pay. And so I try to put in my money and it's change machine. I'm like, oh, bugger. And the guy is like, what I realized is saying after, so you can't pay after you get off. We realized that we did not take the tickets you're supposed to take when you get on. Let him know how many stops you've been on. But I, because I looked it up on the internet, I knew it was 210 yen. So I just dumped in 210 yen on my way out and had a good day. Because I've paid. I'm just an idiot. We're never going to see this bus driver again. It's not like we're, he's going to see us in Tokyo and be like, you! No, he'll forget about us. Or he'll be like, crazy Americans couldn't figure out the bus. Because he doesn't know we're Canadian. It's great. Sorry, Americans. Us getting off the bus, by the way, is after we're about to cross the bridge over the river. And Kathleen goes, oh, you should probably hit the stop button now. Not realizing that there's a stop button directly in front of her that she's been wanting me to push. So I'm like, uh-oh. And I push the button and the driver... Because we are now, and I did not realize this, we are now about to pass the bus stop. And the driver goes, oh, and pulls over. And we're like, oh boy, we're never coming to Gifu ever again. Oh no, it's the worst. We're terrible. Everything's gotta have a mascot. This is the mascot of the cormorant fishing. He's a cormorant and also a fisherman. He's very confused. The cormorant fishing was amazing, uh, better than, than I expected. Uh, the entire description and tour was in Japanese, so uh, I will explain to you what we learned from the book and from one of the guides being very, very patient and kind in coming over and telling us the English version after he'd on the Japanese version. So, uh, and there is a one exclusive boat for bathroom. Mm -hmm. It's over there. So, if over we there. need to go to the bathroom, we get off the boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done cormorant fishing this way in Gifu since at least 702. That's <laughs> over 1300 years ago. As it stands today, there are six cormorant masters, uh, down from a much higher number. It is a position that is inherited. It was passed down with family. The term Cormorant Master is actually an official title as recognized by the Board of Ceremonies of the Imperial Household Agency. It was actually started this way because of 
Nobunaga Oda basically determining that the cormorant fishing masters were so important and so relevant culturally and for the fish that he sort of canonized the job as an important thing to be maintained and that's why it's still happening to this day. For that position, they get about $100 a month, but they've turned it into a successful tourist thing, so I, I, I feel like they're probably doing okay, because it was about 30 bucks. It was 3,400 yen per person, and there was many, many full boats out there. Uh, you could even charter an entire boat for a private function. The way it works is pretty simple, and maybe you won't be down with this. I'm not here to make that call for you, but basically, they take these cormorants. These are actually ocean cormorants. These are not from around here, but they take the cormorants, and they give them a little rope harness, basically, so that they can keep them on a leash without, like, wrenching on their neck or their wings or whatever and pull them back to the boat. And then they tie a rope around their neck. Not too tight, but tight enough that the big sweet fish that they're fishing can't actually get all the way down their throat. And so the one master has 12 of them out on ropes, and they'll dive down and catch a fish and surface again, and then the master has to see which ones have big throats, haul them aboard, and then make them hork the fish back up. Which doesn't sound pleasant. They're not hurting the birds. They're definitely making them unpleasant. Uh, the guidebook, for its part, says, the lifespan of a wild cormorant is approximately seven to eight years. But the cormorants used on the Nagara River are well cared for and treated like family by the fishing masters, and their lifespan is 15 to 20 years. There was a whole boat full of salarymen. Clearly it was like a company, like a special staff dinner. Um, there was one boat that had been rented out by a TV thing, a uh, TV, I don't know if it was a network or a show or exactly what it was, but a, a famous uh, comedian was on it doing a bit on the, you know, doing like so-and-so goes and watches the cormorant fishing. And there were some Japanese people on our boat who were like, oh, it's that guy. Turns out, everybody here speaks better English than we speak Japanese. That's what we've determined. First, I was like, I don't know. Sure, I guess I'll see this. This sounds fine. When Graham explained it to me in Canada. Now that I'm here, I'm like, oh my god. Thank you, Graham. You were right. I was wrong. The boat left at 6.15 and then we puttered up river for a while, first under human power and then after it got started to get worse and harder and harder, then a motorboat came by and we hooked our we hooked ourselves onto the motorboat and then we're all like, yeah. And we went out there and then we sat for a bit while it was getting dark. It was it's beautiful and gorgeous and then it got darker and darker. It turns out that they can't start the cormorant fishing until 7.45. The way that it works is they do it at night while the fish are lethargic. 
and they do it by firelight. Um, presumably they could do it with normal lights now, but the fire looks cooler. And they use the light for, uh, one, so that the cormorants can see better, and two, to scare the fish, because the fish are lethargic, and then this light comes over, and they panic and run away, and the light from the fire reflects off the shiny underbelly of the fish, and the cormorants can see them better and catch them while they're lethargically going, no, this is a light, no, and then the cormorants grab them. And they... So what happens is, and then the six boats come down with their fire pot, uh, and they come down one at a time, and you see them. There's the guy at the front of the boat, right by the fire, and he's like poking the fire to knock stuff into the water and make it more scary, and banging on the side of the boat to encourage the cormorants, and talking to them, and he's got 12 ropes in one hand and he's watching them and then they'll dive down and pop up and he'll grab it and haul them up and make them hork up the fish and then send them back out again. They only feed them once a day obviously so that they're hungry for this and so they get fed immediately afterwards and at the end of it we could see them pulling them up one at a time and making them sit on the edge of the boat uh, in age order depending on their proximity to the bonfire and they would just sit there and wait until they got their thing untied and then they'd be fed and put back in their little little cormorant basket and uh, it was it was just beautiful it was it was amazing and uh, by and large I, I mean I've said I've been talking for like what feels like ever but I'm gonna try and let most of the footage speak for itself because it was really really pretty After all that, we then docked for the final sort of pass by of them then putting the cormorants away. And a boat pulls up on the other side with two sumo on board in their full yukata outfit with their staff and attendants and everything. So we've got a TV comedian for one of the endless Japanese television variety shows on one boat. We've got two sumo on another boat. We've got a group of salarymen on a third boat. It was. It was a pretty Japanese experience. We, we could look up uh, Mount Kinka and see uh, Gifu Castle floodlit at night through the fog while these, these guys are going up and down the river with bonfires and cormorants. It was, it was pretty amazing. Uh, would recommend, but definitely don't forget to bring food. You will want the food. Yeah.
ya va. So as you all know, I am extremely concerned with animal welfare. I don't like going to see things where I don't think the animals will be well treated. I don't like zoos for this reason, because I often disagree with the sizes of the enclosures that you see at zoos and aquariums, and so I was a little like, hmm. Uh, to do this uh, uh, cormorant fishing thing. But we get there and they're like, no, 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 they're treated like pets. You know, like these are like not just cormorants that we just like take out off a rock and like make them do this. Like these are, and I was like, well, um, you know, and they weren't handled with what I would say with like the way I would handle one of my precious baby angel cats. But they didn't seem to be like abused and the birds were like tame and sitting on the boat and seemed to like know what was up. More importantly, they had a distinction about how the the they tie the rope around the neck. The rope around the neck is loose enough that they can breathe and it doesn't interfere with them, but also small fish. They get to eat any small fish they catch. The rope only catches the biggest ones. So uh, the, the tour guide was explaining this, and I said, so they get to eat some small fish then? And he's like, yes. Why is that relevant? Like, that, he didn't say the why was that relevant, but that was, like, definitely, like... He was wondering why I was asking him that, but that made me very happy that they can eat small fish. So I hope at least a few of those cormorants are like, fuck it, I'm only going after the small ones because I could just eat those. Mm -hmm.